Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to day three of Terms of Art. Um, we're kicking off this morning with a fantastic session, Designing and Curating East Asia Art in the Digital Age. And immediately following this session, there will be um, a continuing the conversation. So stick around for that. Our presenters are Dr. Sho Su Hua, Felisa Chu Yi, Dr. Ling Yu, um, Dr. Harold Kramer, and Janet Fong Man Yi. Take it away. Hi. Um, thank you. Thank you, Marcus. And I would be the first one to present um, my topic. And uh, beforehand, I would also like to very briefly to talk about, you know, the the title, uh, the topic that we, we, as the main core issue, designing and curating East Asia art in the digital, digital age. Uh, within this scope, we, you know, we start up with two questions, as you can see from our PPT, that's uh, like what activities, ideas and histories give meaning to and create space for promoting, you know, our, within our GLAM institutions like galleries, libraries, archives and museums, right? Uh, and um, also about the second question, I think um, for my presentation that will also be quite relating to the second question that uh, how do our disciplinary and curatorial orientations like approaches affect how collections or catalogs are described, decoded or translated or inter interpreted? Uh, and also uh, how do we create exhibitions with those like uh, user-centered design technologists work? Um, so within these two questions, we also have those uh, concerns that uh, maybe you already have read as well. So I will not, you know, just spell it out now, but just uh, keep those tests here uh, just for your references, including like the, those highlights here. But um, yeah, and then we will discuss the sustainability from the perspective of indexing the collections and archives, as well as the cost visibility and reproducibility of the projects in our um, life uh, cycle. So, well, back to my own uh, uh, presentation today, it would be mainly about a museum exhibition, which is called FNSX at History of the Future that was happened uh, in Shenzhen uh, in a, a museum called Cloud Art Museum that was held last summer in 2022. Um, just very briefly explain to you why we have FNSX because uh, the title itself is a little bit broad, like History of the Future, especially about history. So I would like to uh, using the four artists perspective uh, to explore the possibility about history of the future. So the FNS8 were the, um, the surname of the four artists. So that's the, 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 the outcome of the name of this exhibition. So I was the one to curate this exhibition and uh, sorry, uh, okay. And then um, next will be, yeah, as you saw, that's the poster. And then um, it was held last year about some digital tools with the curative practices. Um, that's the space of the exhibition, uh, of the museum. And just wish to, before I uh, further explain the exhibition, I would like to show you just uh, 17 seconds trailer if you if it's too loud just let me know that's the trailer the preview just to give you some concepts about the exhibition first okay so and then um 
In this exhibition, I would like to use the perspectives of spaces, materialities, and visualizations uh, as the main angles to, to be discussed. And um, this is an exhibition relating to the artistic practices with digital, digital tools and technology. So um, while I would also like to explore like any future possibilities about uh, human being and then the social changes uh, uh, relating to us and the technology itself. So that's also why I have this uh, uh, title of the exhibition. And the main angle to talk about is about the technology dissolves the, the boundaries between virtual worlds and the physical spaces, because this exhibition uh, was also held in a physical space in the museum itself, but we use a lot of the digital technology and to, you know, crossing, uh, uh, crossing those uh, boundaries between these two spaces. And, um, and this and also for this exhibition, I would like to explore um, more experiments uh, about the new technologies, uh, how to how it how do they um, changing some possibility of some traditional art forms by using new technologies. That's also uh, one of the things that I would highlight today. So um, for today, I think I cannot explain too many about the three perspectives, mainly spaces and material materialities within um, three artworks that I would choose to further explain. And um, so, for example, uh, my, I would like to highlight the object. That's why I will also talk about some uh, definition on new possibility of sculptures in this museum exhibition. Um, uh, virtual space and physical space have different meanings of the existences of objects and like how the those uh, shape were materialized by the AI and well what will happen between it and our original understanding of physical matter so um, like using the like installations or sculptures in the exhibition while virtual reality is just supposed. So that's some questions I would like to uh, raise up here in the exhibition. So that's something also I, I already mentioned. And yeah, that there were some references when, when I just start up this uh, exhibition. So it is, I will use some artworks to explain this issues like from the traditional art form to use new technology and how it can you know it may it may affect the experience of reality beyond sensory experience uh, of human so that is some exhibition space photo and then um also for this exhibition i would like to let each audience to uh, acquire some interactive experience like the mixed reality environments in the museum with the virtual space as well. So that is the first one that I would like to uh, uh, talk about is the work called Flash Projections that are including two sculptures so-called sculptures and the video as well. So um, uh, as you can see from the texts that um, the artist collected thousands of objects through 3D GAN, uh, 3D generated, like they're from those tools that like in the uh, Paleolithic Stone Age that they use until nowadays, like we used iPhone. So he inputs thousands of those images that he he found he he found uh on on the on the web uh like from the aged um uh, neolithic age to nowadays like mobile phone or laptop so um after those uh ai generated images coming up he made he curated the uh the animation with the space and the objects uh in the virtual space at the same time, he outputs, he really printed out using the 3D printed skills to print out those sculptures and the form itself was curated from the virtual world. Uh, 
So um, that's a kind of um, mixing up between the virtual and the reality. I will show you some of some more uh, images and the video. So here is the video. So it's only a very quick one. Sorry, because it's, I will show you some more, but uh, will be the general exhibitions one. So you can see that there are some uh, animations behind, and those are the uh, source where the sculpture is coming from, because the sculptures are, are, are seeing, you know, those audiences can see the sculptures in the physical space, but in fact, it was produced and created in the virtual world. And it was on the air. This is not really fixed uh, on, on a platform, but on the air. So the artist tried to use, uh, try to explore the possibility about the, you know, the definition of sculpture uh, in a non-traditional way. Yeah, that's the idea, uh, one of the ideas. Okay. So, and then that's the second example I would like to show that is Xu Yibo's work. Uh, well, that is also a, a real physical sculpture that uh, the audience, uh, only, only when you can go, when into this museum, uh, that you can only see this artwork, that you cannot only see it online. So, but here, like Pandora Cube, uh, uh, they, the artist also tried to project the virtual images here. So I would like to show you what, what's the idea with it. Yeah, so that is the real physical cube and then projecting this idea that having some more um, uh, spaces beyond the physical space. So it's another possibility of um, exploring the art form of being a sculpture. So, you know, like the way to appreciate of traditional sculpture might be, you know, be a new angle on it. That's, it's quite a long animation. So they can give the audiences having different, uh, um, ideas on you know how this physical cube to create with the virtual world with their own unique image yeah so um yeah so that two artworks that i demonstrated would also like to um show that like shankins like daniel's work articulates the hyper materiality of daily life through artificial intelligence but at the same time, Xu Yibo, like the, the left one, inserts the real world into the virtual. So that's some uh, statements I would like to see uh, tell you. So that is the last example that I would like to talk about. But uh, within this muse museum exhibition, we have over uh, 13 artworks. But uh, today I would just show three of them. So you can see there are some virtual trees, you know, similar ideas as, uh, as Daniel Schenken, virtual trees and real material trees. And I would also like to um, to just indicate some points that are within my music uh, my exhibition that I would like to explore. Like here about matter from form. And then here I would like to also show you a video about you know how Peter Nelson, this artist, this artist to talk about his work. Hi there. Uh, my name's Peter Nelson. Uh, so a little bit of background on Visions of the Last Forest King. Uh, this work was, uh, has really two stories behind it. The first is the technological tool that was used to make it. Uh, in this case, it's a machine learning system that, unlike uh, a lot of systems that are popular at the moment that are trained on two-dimensional images, uh, this system works with three-dimensional objects. Um, and in my case, we use trees. Uh, the, re the reason we use trees is that for a machine learning system, you need to have a data set. And in order to make a large number of anything in 3D, working procedurally is often a very good idea. So we made uh, 26,000 three-dimensional trees 
um, with the tree generation software. And these trees were largely based on uh, works from uh, English and German landscape painting and Chinese land landscape painting. And we used these trees to then train a system that could then generate new trees sort of out of nowhere. And this was sort of a, a technological research project. The other half of the exhibition looks at a science fiction story based on a computer that can recreate memories. So I'm taking this system that can recreate trees and telling a story about uh, the history of forestry and in a way the birth of modernity. Um, the Norman conquest of England is marked by certain historians like Simon Sharma as sort of the birth of modern forestry, seeing trees as a particular economic resource and really sort of setting in, setting in line a lot of developments that would then feed into the Industrial Revolution uh, in England. So I chose this moment of a sort of imaginary machine based on the writing of Isaac Asimov, um, an imaginary machine that can reconstruct fragments of the past out of nowhere. Uh, I've been uh, trained as a painter for about 25 years, uh, initially in oil painting and um, architectural drawing, but I've studied Chinese painting for quite some time. And in these particular works, I was interested in the question of form and different philosophical structures for finding form. Um, on the one hand, I, I enjoy the work of philosophers like Francois Julien, and I've been very inspired by his writing about Chinese ink painting. And on the other, I had this technological system that sort of tried to find the idea of a tree. So the use of painting in this exhibition was combining a sort of Taoist approach to form of um, the object coming out of a state of um, being non-defined and, and gradually reaching a form of definition through ink and then overlaying this with the computer similarly trying to sort of start with the undefined noise of a machine learning system and to work towards um, the defined shape of the tree. So sort of overlaying these two systems of representation together. Okay, um, I hope you enjoy the exhibition. Yes, so um, that is the um, introduction about this artist's work, Peter Nelson, that he has two series of works at the same time. And uh, because of the time limits, so I will not further uh, study and discuss about some other artworks uh, in this uh, panel discussion. But at last, I would like to just simply show you one uh, very short um, exhibition uh, on what well, I, we can call this this online exhibition, just very short one as the end of my presentation. have also some a uh, VR AR AR at work Thank you. Thank you so much. So the next one will be uh, uh, Zhu Yi. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. Hi, um, can you hear my voice? Okay. So 
I will share my screens. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Joey Felicia, and uh, I would like to share some of you my um, observations and experience of museum practices in Chinese museums and via the topic of presence and technology um, in experiencing Chinese art. So my talk will about like 15 minutes. So, yeah, so actually digital technology has become a common method um, of display in museums and is also widely used in the presentation and creation of Chinese art. So here's some um, examples you can see. And also some debates about the use of digital technologies as well as in displaying Chinese art is in on, ongoing. And some scholars worry it may hinder the appreciation and lead to cognitive barriers. While well, others believe that it can enhance the experience and also protect the artworks from damage in displays. So take an example here. So this is the um, digital version of the famous painting um, in Song Dynasty. It's more than 900 years ago. That is along the river during the Qingming Festival. So this is, was made for the Shanghai World Expo in 2010, attracting over 100,000 uh, daily visitors. And you can see this digital version is quite large, um, which almost 30 times the size of the original one. So as scholar Wu Hong doubt, this digital technology can create cognitive misunderstandings of our work. And it's changed the features and the material and therefore affected the public's experience of observing the original painting. While well, a question was here, despite the fact that the technology is being questioned, curators, educators, and artists continue to use it. So I want to explore why and especially how can we understand the ways contemporary visitors interact with objects and paintings of Chinese art via digital technologies. And I believe that is not only the cool appearance of technology that attracts viewers and gives them the great visual impression, but also create an intense experience that connects to our traditional culture, invoking a strong sense of presence. So here I may answer the question with the um, perspective of presence theory. So this is refers to the feelings of being fully immersed in an exhibition or a particular space within a museum. And it involves engaging the visitor's sense, emotions, and intellectual curiosity to create a memorable experience that is beyond just observing and reading. So like the scholar Sims demonstrate here, new technology can reveal device meanings in objects that exceed traditional art historical discourse. And well, princess has different meanings in different societies and cultures. And for Chinese art, it helps visitors understand cultural significance and aesthetic connotations. And this is deeply rooted in the tradition of appreciation. And technologies can provide a similar experience allowing visitors to interact with artifacts in an intimate and interactive way even if they are not physically present. So one typical example here um, is the appreciation tradition in the Yaji event. 
So this is the um, 2000 year tradition of literary gathering of artists and the collectors. So as you can see a famous painting here depicts the literary are sitting around the table and appreciating objects. While so many um, contemporary scholars assert that the building of Chinese art needs to incorporate traditional modes of appreciation. For example, the curatorial project, Yellow Box and Yaji Garden, aim to explore Chinese aesthetic space and the culture of connectorship for contemporary social practices. So here, this is um, display setting of a scroll painting in Yellow Box exhibition in Taiwan. So actually the viewing mood of scroll is quite unique in Chinese art, which requires the uh, observer to use their arms to unroll the scroll painting slowly and steadily, like a motion picture. So in the yellow box exhibition, movable viewing frames are installed to encourage viewers to reframe the hand scroll and foster more dynamic interactions with the work. And now we can see some different example here um, that is from the Henan Museum in China, which use a digital moving screens to replace a movable one. So, well, the Yellow Box and the Yaji Garden projects need to reconsider strategies to encourage broader audiences. As some um, scholars argue here, firstly, it's not fully applying the digital media technology. And secondly, its target audience is perceived as limited and elitist. And thirdly, the project risk being viewed as isolated efforts to reenact historical culture, requiring relevance to contemporary society. So here I want to share another more convincing case that is um, in fellity digital humanities research exhibition and Guanshan Yu Museum in 2022. So this museum is a national art museum named by the Yunnan School artist Guanshan Yu, which officially opened in 1997. And this exhibition celebrates the museum's 25th anniversary. So the main reason I share this exhibition as it's most cover the, uh, it's almost covered the most common ways of displaying Chinese artworks in museums, such as AR, VR, AI, digital moving scrolls. And in addition, it's also applied the Yaji practices into its curatorial methods. So the first method is the uh, display of Qu Shui Liu Shang. So it's a Chinese phrase that is um, literally means winding streams and flowing cups. So you can see the right hand paintings here depict the scene. And in this exhibition, the booth is designed in the form of winding streams and interactive digital screens on the booth seem to be the flowing cups. And the second Yaji method is the application of the idea of Wanshan. So the play connectorship. Um, play has been directed by a specific cultural region of connectorship in Yaji event. And the digital movie screens here interact audience with a playful way. And actually in this exhibition, it offers various elements to engage visitors with playfulness. So I think this engagement can be seen as embodied princess. So it's a um, physical investment in an experience through, experience through active engagement or participation. And firstly, embodied watching in Chinese painting refers to the concept of shifting perspectives. So which is the use of multiple viewpoints to depict a subject, creating a more holistic representation of reality. And secondly, in Yajin events, 
physical participation is emphasized through the act of seeing, touching, and hearing. So they were not only drawing, but also playing music in the Yachi event. So by engaging with the object in this way, participants will fully immerse themselves in the experience and create a deeper connection with the event. And moreover, this, this exhibition also applied a very in the innovative way to display the Guan Shan Yue's small scale flower and bird paintings. For example, here are three sketch works by um, using Unity's 3D dynamic simulation system and AI technology to simulate the dynamic path of these small butterflies. So here is a um, short clip. Yeah, it's very short. And you can see the butterfly will pass from one digital screen to another, allowing uh, the audience to see the butterflies dancing in the spring. So in this, in this way, these form a continuous linking effect. And using this linking, each painting is no longer an independent piece of data but rather than a set of interact, interrelated structures that convey different information and knowledge to the audience. So as the uh, museum professional suggests here, in this way, digital art museums provide a new model of art research and knowledge production. And I also, so saw a similar way of digital displays in Chinese art, uh, of Chinese art and the Suzhou Museum West. So you can see these two jade objects here, uh, the carol and the crane. So they placed a small circular screen in the background board and used um, black and white colors to draw dynamic carols um, and the flying butterflies and the cranes. So I think this is why very different from Oh, it seems like we have a bit of a um, interruption in connectivity. Um, so. um, so how do you want to proceed? Hi, Felicia, are you there? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm back. So I will continue. Sorry for that. I don't know what's happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you see my screen? I'm going to share again. Huh. Yeah, uh, wait a moment. Um... Here, yeah, yeah, I will continue this part. Yeah, for me, I think this um, um, is very different from using large scale um, digital screens or complex technology because it's in line with the uh, subtle and reversed aesthetic style of Asian China. And I think this digital approach brings surprise and resonance well with Chinese audience. And I describe it as the restrained aesthetic here, which refers to the tendency in Chinese culture to appreciate beauty that is expressed in a more understated and restrained manner, rather than through bold or overt displays. So finally, this is an example of AI generated paintings in the style of Guan Shan Yue's work. So the deep learning is achieved by analyzing hundred times of Guan Shan Yue's paintings and results in their ability to Im imitate the painting style. And two works selected here. Um, the up one is Green War, Green Great War, and the lower one is Plot Blossom. So which creates works that are never fixed in form by AI. 
And this seemingly allows viewers to witness the process of the painter's creation and then gives them a sense of participation in the creative process. So as the Professor Yuk suggests, the painting's experience of every stroke indicates a temporary sequence and a spatial configuration that desires to retain this experience. So that is to make what is absent sensible. So here come to the quick summary of the princess experience, experience based on this um, exhibition. So firstly, it's display objects and engage with audience view uh, via the traditional viewing practice of Yaji. And secondly, it creates um, restrained aesthetic on digitally displaying small scale flower and bird paintings. And lastly, is make painters time of creating artworks sensible. So here is the end of my talks. Thank you so much. And we can um, invite the next. Miss uh, Liu Ying. Hi. I will stop yeah, sharing my screen. Yeah. Uh, and just a quick clarification, um, Liu Ying will share her presentation and her talk will be in Chinese, but um, I will provide simultaneous um, translation slide by slide. Um, also, Okay,现在可以了。嗯,大家好,呃,我是来自杭州的刘颖,我的陈述主题是记忆与记忆,现当代水印版画的快媒介收藏。呃,正如大家看到的图中,那个水雾一样,呃,水是中国水印版画形成
And in 2016, um, the um, ZAM held an exhibition titled West Lake Panorama, a millennium of woodblock printing. Um, two years later, in 2018, it held another exhibition titled 1,000 Years of Watercolor Woodblock Printmaking in China. And as you can see on from the poster on the left hand side of the slide, the inspiration for this poster of the exhibition actually originates from Asian book, um, West Lake Panorama, Wu Shen Shen Gai, which was published 400 years ago. The original copy of the book is actually now at the collection of the National Library of France. And the book itself served as the ancient um, tourist map of the city of Hangzhou, Liu Ying. Uh, 水印版画叫陆放先生的一件作品 Fan is a 91-year-old um, water printmaking artist. He's best known for depicting the scenery of the West Lake in Hangzhou. Um, throughout the four seasons. Hallmark of water prints, such as um, the sense of expansive softness as a result of the high level of moisture in the making process and an elegant quality are evident of um, Lu Fan's work. Okay, Liu Ying. In 2019, 那么陆老师他为我们细致的示范讲解了西湖春雨的印制过程做图这张纸这个作品这张图呢他就显示了这种湿润的程度他所掌握的湿润的程度绝几乎决定了他作品印制的成败这非常关键那么这个名家实录带
technique with a little bit of company, with a little bit of help of the waterproof technique. Mm -hmm. 这里就是正在看到的就是我们想这个木板彩踏的技法它其实是脱胎于中国传统的贝塔技法而且它是与现代的特色木板技法相结合的大家看到的这一部分就是我们在吴山这个青年艺术家在创作那么左边看到的这个
Hi everyone. Um, good morning and good evening. Uh, my name is Shaw, and uh, I currently work at the Hong Kong Yi Museum and Art Gallery. Um, my presentation title is Brief Case Studies of Digitalization of Art Exhibitions, Translation and Translocation Across Bodily, Historical and Media Borders. Um, hopefully it invites some reflections and thoughts about the ideas of mobility and translocation. Um, and I do not have a background in digital art or digital art exhibition making, and my case studies were selected to hopefully represent some of the observations from the field work of multi-sided exhibitions in Asia and um, provide some of the contextual information about the evolving scene at the intersection of art and technology in this region. So the curiosity and the question that I would like to uh, really highlight. Sorry? Um, so the question um, that I would like to highlight would be the intersection of exhibition making across the diverse spectrum of media and, uh, and also the activation of very sensory registers, which includes um, translating our own bodily experience and especially that of viewing and cross-cultural interpretation into the text image, performance, dance, music, or a mix of them. Um, here on the slide is a painting titled Viewing Painting, um, created by a renowned Chinese painter and art historian Chen Shizhen. It depicts the mix of crowds of Chinese and Westerners viewing and discussing painting scrolls in an exhibition held in Beijing in order to raise funds for the less privileged in times of political and military turmoil in the early 20th century. Here, the artworks were depicted or in a way reinvented, not just by the making of the images, but also by the instances and context of the viewing, and especially those who were looking at and interacting with them. Sorry, Shaw, would you like to share the full screen? I think now we can see those uh, upper, uh, you know, cannot see the whole view. Can can the rest of you see the whole view of your screen? It's not better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That works. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, so here is um on the slide is the Wan Sui Tong Tian Tie, um, which is a fine selection of ten precious, extremely valuable um, masterpieces by seven Chinese calligraphy artists through the ages. It is now at the collection of the Liaoning Museum in Northeast China. The selection itself demonstrated and preserved the evolution of calligraphic style that evolved over the time span of three to four hundred years from East Jing to Tang Dynasty. In the Chinese New Year Gala in 2022, which was one of the most watched um, gala um, of the whole nation, uh, which was also broadcast internationally, and one dance performance featured this masterpiece in choreography, where the dancer beautifully interacted with the robot who imitated and copied the original works onto large electronic screens, one scroll after another, one screen after another. Sensors were able to identify and detect the location of the dancer to influence the behavior of her motion, um, which was captured um, and at the same time with the animated line drawing, which was in a way similar to Shuangko. As the visitors were entering the special exhibition in gallery number nine in the Hong Kong Palace Museum during the inaugurational show, they will come across three installations that playfully explore the different aspects of the horse, a theme that can be found in different civilizations and cultures around the world such as um, the album leaf of the mythological flying horse, um, which was created by Jesuit painters working at the high Qing courts. They were known for creating a hybrid style combining the Western realism with traditional Chinese conventions of painting. Near the ceiling, um, at the uh, ceiling, uh, this at the exhibition gallery, at the gallery space. Um, there were screens um, hanging um, at the different heights showcasing 3D animations of three flying horses, 
um, from the Palace Museum collection. And they were created by contemporary digital media artists with a technique um, of lenticular processing, which allows a transformation of 2D to 3D depth. And this exhibition explores the rich symbolic, uh, military, and political significance of the horse, one of the most widely liked subjects, not only in Chinese visual culture, but also in countries such as in France, Iran, and Greece, as well as in the United States, and many, many others. The motif of horse was digitally extracted from the original painting. And to the visitors who look up, sometimes they may find the horses flying and passing by. The screen served as a portal into the mythological space, um, an imagination uh, of time traveling where the horses from the ancient time are running or dancing or hopping into the gallery screens. And a little bit of back um, of context here is as we continue along the line of the Chinese mythological creature, Lu Duan is another mythological auspicious creature which looks like a deer with a tail of horse and a single horn. It can travel 5,500 miles a day and speak all word languages. How wonderful is that? In ancient time, China, Lu Duan sculptures were believed to safeguard the houses. Here on the slide in the middle is a pair of Lu Duan shaped incense burner, um, um, which was actually safeguarding um, the house in Suzhou. And in the Beijing Palace Museum, a pair of the Luduan uh, shaped um, incense burner also appear in the hall of the Supreme Harmony, safeguarding the emperor's seat. Um, they were believed to represent enlightenment and justice. In 2022, a popular Luduan themed musical play was produced with the audience being children in China. Equipped with 3D technology, new media and elements of animation, the content of the plan tell the vivid story of the palace museum, its history, and how they were narrated by the interactions among the different mythological creatures who were the main characters of the play. Costume design and stage design also took on inspiration from art history of not just auspicious animals, but also of based on the interior space of the Forbidden City. Um, on this slide, uh, we also see um, what um, actually um, taking on the inspiration of what um, Felicia has shared earlier in 2010, um, exhibition of the digitalized paintings grow um, along the river during the Qingming festival was um, displayed in the Shanghai World Expo in 2010. And it represents one of the hallmark and milestone um, and quite extremely popular um, exhibition making where um, it was able to mix um, different um, digital tours and attracted a large number of audience and visitors. The installation of digital exhibition taking inspiration from the impressionist artist Monet took place in Shanghai in 2016. And a series of commercially successful immersive and interactive shows produced by Team Lab Tokyo Um, in many, um, also took place in many cities in East Asia and um, or in China with increased use of the immersive VR in contemporary arts. Taking Shen Jingjing's singularity, for example, who is a young Chinese artist now living in the UK, um, instead of seeking to find ways to represent a realistic version of reality, um, in her work, she shows the dark abstract space where many points of light come together to form a forest. And as people walk in and through the woods, they still see a number of images made up of light spots, ranging from animals to chessboards, to robots, to computers, to which metaphorically connoting the difficulty and um, inability, inability to predict how technology will change and evolve. Based on some of the recent exhibitions, a few questions have been identified and raised by researchers based in China on digital art exhibition making. And the key concern would be how exhibitions, while being technological, empowered and enabled, should actively avoid expressions and presentations of art that lack or fail to deliver the original and substantial content authentically, or that was missing the interior logic. And the content itself and the technology 
like yin and yang, are best when the two are at balance. In the end of this article, um, the two researchers um, ended the quoting um, actually from Manfred Moor that machines should not be perceived as challenges to human beings. They are an extension of our own possibilities. Excellent technology must be integrated into our life. It becomes a part of our body as well as a part of our heart and mind. Besides of some of the major art hubs in mainland China, Hong Kong, the South Korean capital city Seoul, with a very active track history of operating local galleries and museums with international horizon and reputation, as well as um, an influx of international galleries and art fairs, have become a major destination for the international art community to access Asia's art world. With an expedited growth of young collector demographics, the strength of Seoul has also relied on the fact that South Korea does not have um, import tax imposed on art or sales tax for artworks below 50,000 US dollars, as well as a strong state support for creative art and culture. Um, here on the slide is a poster for MMCA special exhibition in 2022, a retrospective on um, a show um, featuring Pai Nam Jun, a legendary um, multimedia um, artist, Korean artist, um, which examined the situation of Korean art from the 1990s onward with a new light and based on the themes previously addressed by historical exhibitions organized by the artist. Um, so it summons back the Korean situation of the 1990s. It was also a time where the modern hope and end of the century anxiety were kind of burning up in flames altogether. Um, and um, three, which was uh, three decades ago. And after 30 years, they are sharing with the contemporary spectaculars today. And I would like to end my uh, sharing today with um, um, a playful, and political installation artwork by the Korean artist um, Ahrem Lee, who, which was on display in the New Art Gallery in Calgary, um, in Canada, uh, in 2023. So this um, Vino piece combines Google Maps with Korean hopscotch with overlapping borders representing border conflicts, which is um, a large project, um, um, which is a large projection of the Google Street View combined with the video game Dance Dance Re Re um, Revolution. It is um, quite interactive and visitors who enter the show are allowed to stand and play on it if they choose. Um, this case study itself just briefly shows how approaching the very serious and sometimes um, political and really difficult conversations involving ongoing um, disputes in a playful manner, um, in a, like in a game with a very bright um, color palette allow visitors of different backgrounds, of different belief system to engage in a different uh, method methodology and sentiment. Thank you all for your time and attention. I am now going to pass the floor to um, Dr. Hayward Kramer. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Well, one moment. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So good morning. I would like to thank the organizers as well as the speakers of this workshop. And I would like especially like to thank my very esteemed colleague Shaw for all the organization. Um, nearly 25 years ago in 1999, at a museums and a web conference in New Orleans, Larry Friedlander from Stanford University asked some questions which still have an impact on the discussion about media until today. How can we catch the attention of the user and decelerate the dynamics of the user attitudes? How can we simplify the complexity of the information by not losing its value and message? What kind of user prefers what kind of information architecture and interface design? 
how do we integrate media rich environments with people rich ones and make them human, warm, and conducive to learning? How do we organize these experiences for the user so they can make sense of them without robbing them of the inherently rich and spontaneous qualities? One question kept my interest. What kind of user prefers what kind of information architecture and interface design? When I started working with multimedia in the 1990s, I was keen to find out how we could use these technologies to teach art. When I analyzed CD-ROMs, I developed my own typology. I created three types of visitors, users, information architecture, and navigation. So depending on our need, we are all type A, B, and C at times. That means we all are connoisseurs, we are all collector of events, and we are all active consumers of stories and exhibitions. And it's very interesting that the five types John Falk has created in 2006 will fit to these three types. So that means informative, narrative, explorative, and ludic. All of these four can be educative. So we take educative out and focus on these four. First, I would like to give a short overview about some multimedia classics, arranged roughly according to the informative, narrative, explorative, and ludic share. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot go into each individual example in detail, detail, but I would like to highlight one in particular, uh, Vienna Warp. This is the prototype for an interactive movie from 1998. And as you can see, there is a function that you can, in this interactive movie, that you can send an email to one of the protagonists, which was really a sensation at that time. So this is one of the, an overview that I made using some of these multimedia classics. And um, so we have in the left corner, we have uh, narrative and on the bot on, on the top informative. On the right, we have explorative and ludic. The interesting thing here is that most of these products have been um, related to all of these things. So you have some ludic elements, so some game characters, you have a little bit explorative things, you have a lot of information, and you have amazing great stories. So why I show this, um, today we are facing a loss of our digital cultural heritage. The reasons for this loss have been, for example, two decisions made by Apple uh, since two, OS X 10.6, so 2009, um, Apple is running on Intel processors. That means that no CD-ROM is running anymore. And since 2010, 2010 there are no flash-based CD-ROMans websites. So all these things uh, have been lost in the, in the last year. Um, that's why I created a long time research project, Multimedia Classics, Hypermedia Hermeneutics, Museums and their Digital uh, Intangible Heritage. Meanwhile, I have made an archive with over 400 multimedia applications and I have a database with 700 case studies. The goal is to create an oeuvre catalog with innovative examples and case studies. Let's go now to the last 10, 15 years. Is this the future of communication in museums, the VR? The situation today is a little bit different than that one that we have, that I have shown before. Now we have all these technologies which are strong used in museums and di different kinds of museums. So we still have audio guides, which are still extremely popular, especially in German speaking countries and are gladly accepted by many visitors. We have podcasts, which have survived the initial hype and have not gone out of fashion, but are popular means of communication. The museum's databases are now filled to the brim with images and information. The factual information about the objects is made available by the museums in the form of digital collections on their websites. 
There is still room for improvement in the provision of metadata and the further development of thesauri and ways of searching for information. The widespread of use of smartphones and mobile technology has led to a boom in apps. However, most of these are online brochures with just a little interactivity. They are far away from the richness of past CD-ROMs. Since augmented reality can now be offered as an app and used on the smartphone, they are very popular. Most of the AR apps are about reconstructing original contexts. This can concern architecture, installation, function, problems of restoration, but also different conditions. Due to the increasing participation of visitors, more and more art museums are adopting communication strategies from science museums. Some are in danger of becoming amusement parks and rely on light gymnastics. I will show you some examples later. As virtual reality technology has become cheaper, several VR applications have been developed in recent years. The focus is on both the reconstruction of historical spaces and the creation of immersive experience spaces. Huge immersive spaces that use 40 and more projectors to create strongly colored AV audiovisual spaces as a 360 degree experience will increasingly become massive competitors to the museums of the future. So here I just want, would like to show some of the examples. We all know most of them. We know the Cleveland Artlands, um, the VR of Mona Lisa or Rembrandt or Klimt of Garden. There are a lot of other uh, examples that, that we can mention, but let's have some uh, examples. Yeah, that's the collection wall from Cleveland, from the Artlands Gallery. And here you see a picture, uh, which is from the museum's website. When I was there, um, the situation was like this. Come on. So, yeah. so that's the reality. Yeah. So we are far away from this uh, luxury um, search function. You see there are a lot of people who are doing the same. And um, yeah. Let's have another example also from Cleveland. Strike the figure's pose and see how it feels. Let's have a look at this. So the reenactment re of the given position has only little relation to the content, but serves primarily for self-expression and the amusement of the audience. Let, has, let us have some examples from Hong Kong. Tobias Kremler, he installed this pose-matching installation in the 300 years of Hakka Kung Fu exhibition in the Hong Kong Heritage Museum. A certain position from Hakka Kung Fu is explained then serves as a model and is to be reenacted by the visitor. Let's have a short cut of this too. So the position, the position that you can see on the back is uh, a flying crane which is part of the Hakka Kung Fu movement. Here, a certain position, uh, the content determines the gesture computing. So it means that the content is part of the, of the game and much more stronger than the other example. Rebuilding the Tonkin Ships was a new media art exhibition, um, a cooperation between City University of Hong Kong and the National Palace Museum uh, in Taipei. Um, based on the Tongan ship, the exhibition offered different forms of communication information 
and entertainment through interactive media. Let's have a closer look to the gesture-based game. So it remains unclear what the movement has to do with the substantive action. Furthermore, it is extremely questionable to integrate such a shooter game into an exhibition context without further explanation. Let's have an, uh, another example. That's uh, the exhibition Leonardo da Vinci Art and Science, then and now, also from City University of Hong Kong. Pick up a tablet and walk into the cave an invitation for an augment, augmented reality discovery of a virtual cave. Uh, the cave is based on the painting Leonardo da Vinci, Virgin of the Rocks. This is a copy of the original painting from the 17th century. So that means it was really an original painting which was there to see. Let's have a look at, uh, oh, there's no video. Unfortunately, there's no video. Um, good, doesn't matter. Um, the video, you can see what these guys are seeing here. So they walk into this cave and um, it has nothing to do with the situation of the protagonist. So you never see uh, the Virgin Mary and Jesus and uh, the other protagonists. You only see the cave. The original work of art is without a viewer. The visitors lost in a virtual space. The cutout protagonists of the painting in their function as eye catchers and decorations. And all information depends on the functioning of the media. It means there is a huge gap between the original painting, the interpretation of the contents on the one hand, and the exploration of the virtual and purely fictional cave on the other. Without a more in depth explanation, the exploration of the cave remains stale and empty. In view of these examples shown, the question arises whether the interactive media are actually used purposefully to convey content, or is it the main function to entertain visitors and lead them to light gymnastics? Are art museums turning into an amusement park in the 21st century? What are the potentials of the museum? How can they be opened up for a new understanding through the creative use of media? Let's have three answers for this question, which also could be a starting point for our discussion. Even if a museum is so multimedia based, this does not change the way of thinking that hides behind it and only varies in the depth of its expressions in terms of technology. New media does not mean new thinking. As the former director of the Tate, Nicholas Sorota, declared that interpretational experience is the dilemma of the Museum of Modern Art, he framed this tension as a major opportunity for art museums, thinking of museums as places of confrontation, of discourse, and of creativity. And the last one, Joseph Boyce, in his book, The Museum, a conversation about his tasks, possibilities, and dimensions from 1997, the German artist Joseph Beuys explained that museums have to change. He demanded to make the museums into universities, which then practically have a department for objects. Given a traditional understanding of the role of museums, the university would be the better institution because when you're at a university, there is an interdisciplinary connection between all fields of human activity. And because this interdisciplinary context is capable of developing a new concept of art. In summary, museums in the 21st century should have more courage for new ideas when dealing with new technologies, that as well as meeting the needs of different visitor groups for experience and interpretation, that museums should see themselves as universities with collections in order to use their artifacts to answer the urgent questions of our time, and that museums should counter the current trend of nicely designed 
but empty VR environments, entertaining games, and light gymnastics with the potential of their stories, because museums are born storytellers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you all so much. Um, we are a little tight on time. Um, we got about five minutes for questions and I see two in the chat so far. Um, and so we'll we'll um, we'll try to we'll try to run through these because they're they're big questions. Um, we received a question from the audience. I find the mixture of tradition and technology you've shown us incredibly compelling. Can you say a bit more about the philosophy of mixing the two? From my own experience working with hybrid interactive pieces, I can imagine some of the exhibitions you've shown being controversial at many of the art institutions, unless um, the creator... Yeah. So how shall we start? How shall we do that? We got some questions. Yes, yeah, so I'm going um, to read the question if any, somebody could jump in and answer. I don't know who should answer the, the question, the, the first one. Um, it looks like we have an answer already um, from Liu. We received a question from the audience. I find the mixture of tradition and technology you've shown us incredibly compelling. Um, who should answer this question? Um, Dr. Kramer, it looks like... A bit about the philosophy of mixing the two. Uh, Dr. Kramer, it looks like it was answered in the chat too from um, from um, Liu, um, Liu Yang. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Kramer, do you hear me? Well, I, I can say a few words about my own experience. When I started in the mid 1990s to bring multimedia into museums, um, it was very difficult to um, explain. And often the multimedia applications have been understood as a, as a kind of a rival. And uh, it was very difficult. So if it's only a database that you show in the museum, that was not a problem. But in the moment when you started to create a story and you made, for example, um, yeah, you, you gave a specific interpretation of something, then you created often a conflict uh, between the interpretation. The authority of the interpretation um, lies um, in the museum. So the curators have, have taken this authority and to show them that a museum, um, for example, a virtual museum can offer more, um, that was, was quite a challenge. And I had one project at the Swiss National Museum and they gave me a lot of um, freedom to, to create new strategies, how, how to tell stories. And one of the objects had, uh, was related to slavery. So they show this object because it's a masterpiece of Swiss um, clockwork making. But um, the, the, this object was given to the mayor of Zurich by his friend, and this guy made his money with slavery. And so by telling the true story online, so it was not in the not in the in the permanent exhibition on the caption, nothing was written about the slavery problem. But because we have shown this in a virtual space, the curator said, "Wow, that's great. Let's let's do it. Yeah, let's find it out. How can we use it?" So it become a kind of a platform that you can do an experiment and find out other things. Okay, um, thank you. I think um, I want to make it's sure that we... Oh. Um, I want to, can the other panelists nod if you can hear me? Okay. Um, we have one more question that I want to make sure everybody can understand or read. Um, for exhibitions like Collection Wall, there is obviously a huge database aesthetic that's being passed on to the visitors. What can institutions do to prepare their collection systems to feed these kind of user-guided interactive experiences? For many institutions I know of, the transition from collection management system to exhibition database would be a significant amount of work. And we got about one minute to wrap this up. Maybe I can share a little bit about this question in my uh, case studies. As the Guangxian Yue Art Museum, actually they have uh, 
conduct a month of research to um, build the database on Guangxiang Yu's artworks. And it's quite related to the um, cultural significance of the artworks and how we want to reach our audience. So in this exhibition, they actually just go back to look at the um, traditional mood uh, of ap appreciation. And based on this method, or maybe involved some of this method, they can pick up some um, uh, relevant case uh, or art works to uh, display via the appropriate digital technologies, then it can also uh, resonance with the uh, audience in a Chinese context. Yeah, so actually, um, yeah, it, this is just the uh, my experience of this um, case study. Yeah, hope I can answer your questions in that way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, that's fabulous. Um, I'm so, I'm very sorry, I feel like a tight cut off, but we have our 1030 session. And so I'm gonna switch moderator duties over to my colleagues um, and thank you again. And if there's any more questions from the audience, feel free to email me directly and I'll pass them off to the team.